uh, when Jonathan asked me if I wanted to to record this uh, comment on this um, uh, my first thought was, well, I don't know anything about this, so yeah, definitely I will. Um, which is uh, sort of, well, it helps that Audrey Waters said that you have to be open to not knowing things. Helps my case. Um, I think it was Alice in Wonderland who said, uh, how do I know what I think? I haven't had a chance to hear what I have to say yet. Um, and I think this is a... This is a I think this speaks to uh, to being able to develop thoughts openly, um, and also the the risk of, of of open sharing is that these things get archived somehow. You know, there's you know you put them online. It's not just like speaking out into a uh, unrecorded live situation or a classroom or whatever where nothing gets recorded. Maybe you say something stupid and it's, you know, somewhat remembered, maybe forgotten, doesn't matter, but it's not recorded. Um, but the nice thing about things being recorded and archived is that you can also uh, accept the fact that things that are said maybe don't have to be taken all that seriously and at the same time should absolutely be taken seriously. It's, uh, you know, it's impossible to say which way you're supposed to see it, but uh, definitely both possibilities uh, are options all the time. Um, so, um, but I don't want to uh, romanticize openness. Um, what Nishant Shah said about... Uh, the disnification of the understanding of what open is is certainly always relevant. You know, just saying open uh, or calling something open doesn't mean that, uh, you know, politics and economy flies out the window that you open. That's just never going to be the case. Um, but like I said, I would like to continue on from what uh, Corey uh, Doctorow said. And this was about his comment about over or under blocking to protect children. Um, so I'll just tell a short story. Uh, I was, um, this is a few years ago, I was inside sitting in the computer. My kids were outside playing. I made up some lie about a, that I had to do some work, but I actually just wanted to sit there and do nothing. Uh, and suddenly there was this 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 boom and a bit of a shake the kids come running in and ask what it was and I didn't know what it was and I sort of said that that was probably thunder although I didn't think so anyways it turned out to be this explosion a few years ago uh, with uh, Anders Bering Breivik who um, who let off a bomb in the city center and then went on to shoot uh, more than 70 kids at a summer camp um, anyways, the reason I bring this up was because then I had to explain this to my kids. And this was a police officer who was shooting kids. He was dressed up as a police officer. So, you know, what they thought was something of a symbol of uh, security and a symbol of uh, trust, something that they could rely upon, was now changing for them. And this... Uh, this caused a great deal of distress. They were, you know, uh, and a lot of kids, of course, were feeling this, and this will happen any place where kids are um, the target of these horrific events, of course. But the experts, uh, you know, advice is always the same when it comes to this. When, when something traumatic happens, when something uh, horrific happens in society... And the kids are feeling uh, anxiety about this whole thing. The question is, how do you explain this to the kids? What are you supposed to say to them? And the advice is always the same. Tell them everything. Be completely open with them. Tell them everything you know. Try to find out all you can about this thing. And talk to them about what it is. Um, and this, to me, is interesting since we don't deal with society... Um, in the same way before something traumatic happens. 
And we know that traumatic events are going to happen. They're going to continue happening all the time. But we still don't deal with, uh, with society, with this kind of openness and honesty, especially when talking about how to, to inform children about the reality of, of things. We don't deal with this in the same way after something terrible happens as before. Um, and I think this is a big mistake. Um, I think the problem is, um, well, I think the problem is that we are, we are becoming consumers of truth where we can digest and regurgitate and, and reject truth, uh, at such a high speed that, that, um, um, I mean, verification and, and all these kinds of uh, tools that we can use they, they just happen so quickly there's just so much truth out there there's just there's just too much truth constantly available to us uh, and this is a good thing obviously and it's also a bad thing but uh, learning how to deal with this has to be uh, more of a priority than to learn how to block out what isn't possibly true uh, I recently worked on a project for a bunch of years w with a colleague of mine that we, we were trying to find information about something that had been erased from the history books. And this event had been re erased because after the, uh, the Second World War, uh, it was uh, deemed by authorities that um, history books and school books needed to be gone through and all racist material needed to be taken out which is fair enough, but they removed information about events in history that also were racist events. And one of those was a, a human zoo, like these things are called, where at a world fair or these big national fairs, they, uh, they put on an exhibit with people. And uh, the one that we were talking about in Oslo 1914 was called the Congo Village, but it was actually 80 Senegalese people that were living there for five months. This thing had been completely erased, but we still wanted to find out what is, what knowledge base uh, can be established out uh, among the collective, even if it is only emotional knowledge. But something had to leave an imprint. Something had to... I guess something had to resonate. Something had to linger in the consciousness of the, the, the collective, because this was a huge event at the time, and it was massively popular. And now when we ask people, um, you know, almost nobody has ever heard of it. And, and obviously, it has, to be, it has to be leaving some kind of traces. So doing research in the public through media like this that we were doing um, was done by eliciting a response from the public and then extracting some kind of knowledge through that response. And, um, and this is, um, this is uh, I guess, creating a kind of, um, of opening up of information, whether that is um, emotionally based information, factually based information, it doesn't really matter. Um, because, anyways, to go back to the point that I was trying to make, I do think that we are... Um, growing quite suspicious of truth and what truth is, and maybe this is a good thing as far as moving ahead in the evolution. Anyways, in this stage of evolution, I guess, that we have to accept truth and untruth at the same time to be able to say that uh, religion is truth. I mean, even that religion is absolute truth, and at the same time say that truth is an absolute religion, that they both can exist as, as uh, contradictions at the same time. Um, anyways, that's probably where I should stop, but I just want to say that, um, that, 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 um, that working, uh, I mean, I work as an artist, and, and it's, uh, it seems to me that fiction is sometimes given too much of a uh, the, too much hope is put into the function of fiction of what it is actually capable of doing that it will teach us something about reality it will it's a it's a place where we can ground some real understanding of things and i think this is an ex this is a mistake because 
Uh, I don't actually think that fiction fundamentally changes the way that we think. Um, you know, we, we accept fiction as long as, the, as long as we know that it is fiction. If we don't know that it's fiction, we feel duped, and, and this uh, causes us to reject it, even if it turns out to be fiction. So uh, I do think that, um, that, that we have a problem with truth. Maybe truth isn't going to uh, help us move forward, and maybe fiction isn't going to help us move forward. But perhaps deception will, and maybe we do need to be deceived um, into thinking that we are good in order to do good. And then we're almost back uh, at religion. That might be an insult to some people who are religious, of course. But just, you know, both of these ideas could be a reality at the same time. Uh, yeah, that's interest. That's boring, I think. Just accepting all positions all at the same time. I'm bored by that. That's no fun. But anyways, talk to you later.